Good morning. Hello, my name is Joy Ashby Cornthwaite, and I'll be your host for this episode of the live stream show, My Diabetes HQ Live. This weekly broadcast is developed and produced by Cities Changing Diabetes volunteers from here in Houston and also our sister city, Philadelphia, which recently joined the global network of 25 cities working to improve diabetes prevention, care, and management. You can learn more about Cities Changing Diabetes by going to citieschangingdiabetes.org. The purpose of this effort is to help people with diabetes and their caregivers successfully transition through these very challenging times of COVID-19. Every Saturday, we gather diabetes care experts to discuss and to share their wealth of knowledge about diabetes. We have years of self-care experience, medical care, public health, community health and advocacy, and we will be bringing all of this knowledge to your waiting eyes and ears. We hope that these conversations will give you the tools to build skills, to manage your diabetes, and to live your best lives, not only surviving, but also thriving and doing all the things you want to be doing. Today's episode is coming up right now. You don't want to miss this. Hi everyone, remember that the content shared during the My Diabetes HQ Live broadcast is not intended to substitute your professional medical advice from your physician about diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider for any questions you may have regarding any of your medical conditions. So hello today. Um, to our diabetes warriors, our champions, advocates, and cheerleaders, welcome to this, the sixth episode of My Diabetes HQ Live. To our viewers on My Diabetes HQ Facebook and My Diabetes YouTube channel, thank you and welcome to our show. We're very happy to have you here with us too. And today we have quite a treat for you. We are joined by physician Dr. A.J. Rao, he is an endocrinologist and associate professor at Temple University College of Medicine. Um, today's format, we will have uh, questions and advice um, coming from our guest panel speakers. And also we want to make sure that you, our live viewers, have an opportunity to ask questions and Dr. Rao, no pressure, will provide answers for you. So we'll get, um, we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible during our times together. But even if we don't, go ahead and leave them in the comments and we'll be certain to um, check and send you our responses as well. So here today, Dr. Rao is going to help us tackle some common self-care questions that people have right now. Um, and uh, because this information information is important for individuals living with diabetes, their caregivers, clinicians. We hope that anything, any tips, any um, answers that you hear here today will be able to be placed into your toolbox so that you can provide yourself with great care. Okay. So first, as I said, we have Dr. A.J. Rao, um, Associate Professor at Temple University. He also serves on the advisory board of Cities Changing Diabetes in our sister city, Philadelphia. So good morning. Good morning and thanks for having me. Just excited to be with all of you this morning. We're so, we're so happy to have you. Thank you for taking time. We also have Serena Valentine, CEO of Core Initiatives, a Houston-based nonprofit health and wellness organization. She brings her experiences as a person living with diabetes and her perspective to help her peer support um, members for the um, Houston Peer Support Initiative. Additionally, we have Marianne Strobel. Good morning, Marianne. Good morning. She is a registered nurse and certified diabetes care and education specialist. Um, her specialty is in inpatient and outpatient work and her passion is around um, improving diabetes care and management. 
during and after disasters. She works specifically with Diabetes Disaster Response Co uh, Coalition and serves on our Houston Core team. So let's begin first, okay. So Dr. Rao, before we start, can you share with us, because I, I found and I, and I deeply respect your passion um, for caring with people with diabetes. Can you just share what doing this work um, means to you so that our viewers can, can get that same impact? Sure, you know, such a, such a common medical problem for, for many of our individuals here in the United States. And, um, you know, it's a treatable condition, right? And, and we talk so much about um, living with diabetes and, and, and really trying our best to, um, you know, get good control and be healthy um, and, and really enjoy life with, with diabetes. Um, you know, I've had, I've had obviously um, several family members, but also uh, friends who've had uh, children with diabetes and the struggles that they've gone through. Um, but we're just so excited to help patients uh, and, and stay healthy and, and be better. That is super. I think that for all of us here on the panel, um, it is, you know, that drives our passion, right? To making sure that um, people who come to see us have the most information that they possibly can. And then throughout outreach for people who can't come to see us in clinic um, as well. So um, just to begin with one of the questions regarding diabetes and COVID, you know, we, we spoke about this offline, um, but one of the major um, concerns for individuals is that they haven't been to see their endocrinologist. They have sort of, in addition to sort of shutting down everything else around their lives, they've put a pause on their self-care for this very um, important, uh, you know, disease. What, what would you say to individuals right now who are thinking, you know, maybe I can put a pause on my diabetes care. Maybe I can take a you know, extended COVID break. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great point, Joy. I mean, I think, um, you know, a lot of our patients initially, um, you know, thought that many of this, many of the items related to their diabetes can be handled uh, remotely. And a lot of it can be, but, you know, one thing to remember is that the pause uh, for the actual visit to their provider allows them some time to, you know, go over their condition with an experienced person. And so, you know, at least here in Philadelphia, we've been, you know, slowly um, opening up our, our clinics and, and accepting patients to be seen in person. And we want them to know that it's, uh, you know, that we're taking all of the efforts that we can here to, to make sure that they are safe. Um, and, you know, there are things that they can sort of assess before they make their way in. But, you know, we're open and I think, um, you know, telehealth has definitely helped for sure. Um, but I think one thing to remember is that I've noticed in my practice that patients think of the appointment as the time that they've dedicated in their life to, you know, go over their condition with the provider and that, you know, there's, 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 um, there's some replacement for the face to face, but um, there's nothing, nothing to, to sort of um, replace that in person visit. And, and if it's safe to do so, you know, we want to encourage our patients to, to come back. For sure, um, Serena. Living with diabetes and um, and working with peer support members who are concerned about this. What are some of the questions that they're asking um, of their physicians? Um, well, it's been a consensus that um, a lot of people do not feel comfortable uh, right now especially here in Houston, uh, actually getting out of the house to go to the doctor. Um, uh, like like um, Dr. Rao said, a lot of people have been, you know, kind of limited in where they go and what they do since the pandemic. So yeah, a lot of people who are dealing with diabetes, they're either, they don't want to go <laughs> because the risk of catching COVID. And uh, well, you know, I, I don't, I, if there's something else wrong, cause I haven't been in three months, I don't want to hear about it. You know, you have that portion of the, the people who are dealing with diabetes population as well. Me personally, I have not uh, even tried telehealth yet 
Um, the only thing I've been to is the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> and I go into the dentist. Uh, I, I felt safe <laughs> because everybody was, you know, everybody had suits on, the mask, the face mask, and everything. So uh, I felt comfortable. So I think I might try to contact my doctor about an appointment. <laughs> so just being honest, you know. <laughs> yeah. So let's pull up some of the symptoms, and um, and Dr. Rao can go over. Uh, what to do as you're heading to the clinic so that you can feel a bit comfortable. I think everyone needs to know that um, clinicians and clinics have really stepped it up. They're doing everything they can to protect um, patients and, and to keep us safe. Yeah, no, it's a, a great point. Um, I think, you know, the great thing is many of our clinics have sort of um, these sort of schematics or figures uh, around, but I think um, it's really important to sort of collect your thoughts when you're at home as a patient to think if you're having um, any of these symptoms, you know, before you arrive. So, you know, things such as, you know, fevers or chills, um, cough, uh, shortness of breath, um, you know, obviously, you um, things that are a little bit probably even more specific, something unusual like new loss of taste or smell um, would be something to sort of draw alarm to yourself to kind of maybe ask the clinic is, is you know, is it safe for me to come? You know, is there is there a concern that, you know, I might be having some symptoms uh, consistent with with uh, with COVID-19? Um, and, and I think many of our clinics, for example, I can tell you in our clinic, we're doing a great job of assessing this in advance. Um, but I think if, if patients living with diabetes have any of these symptoms, you know, they should definitely volunteer these to their providers, especially in advance uh, to, a, to an actual scheduled uh, in-person visit. Yeah, super. We, um, we do the same. And actually, you know, one of the, um, one of the tenants of our care practices right now is to, um, is to ask the patient, like you said, ahead of visits to do a triage or an assessment um, before our, our inpatient or before our in-clinic visits and just propose the questions, you know, do you have any concerns? Um, do you, you know, have you been feeling unwell? Um, have you known anyone who else, anyone else who is feeling unwell? And a lot of times, um, you know, asking open-ended question, you know, what are your concerns about coming to clinic right now? And then that garners more of a conversation um, with with your patient ahead of time. And, and I feel like that can reduce anxiety a lot. Is that what you're seeing, uh, Mary Ann? Yes, I, I am seeing a lot of that, a lot of anxiety. One of the things that um, I'm hearing a concern because right now I'm working in the inpatient um, area, is that after discharge, uh, if a patient has been uh, with diabetes, has been admitted for COVID, and they are always told, of course, to follow up with their endocrinologist or their um, diabetes provider, their concern is, you know, how do I do that? Is it better that I go in the office if I can, if it's open? Is it better if I do this with telehealth? Um, if I don't have like FaceTime on my cell phone and I just have to talk to the doctor on the phone, is that okay? So I'm wondering what Dr. Rao may want to say about that. Yeah, I mean, I think the 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 quick touch point in any in uh, you know sort of any technological method, whether it's audio, video, audio and video, is definitely uh, better than nothing. Um, and I think especially um, you know individuals who have uh, you know, had the experience of having COVID might have some treatments that have are being provided to them sort of after hospitalization, whatnot, that is going to affect their sugars uh, a tremendous amount. So I think um, in those scenarios, obviously getting insight from the office and, and you know, obviously mentioning that, that, that they were admitted or um, have symptoms consistent with COVID is important. Um, and, and relaying to them, though, at the same time, the importance of them having sort of this touch point with their provider, because I think that can, at least in that specific setting that you're alluding to, Marianne, could be a very, um, you know, helpful replacement for an in-person visit. Yeah. Good. Sure. So don't forget, um, if you're watching this and you have some questions, just go ahead, drop them um, in the comments below on 
whichever platform you're watching on either YouTube or Facebook, and Dr. Rao will, will get to them. So we have a couple of questions that we wanted to ask you um, that has been that have been asked of us. So the first one being, are um, people with diabetes at higher risk of getting COVID-19 if their diabetes isn't well managed? Yeah, this has been one of those, you know, sort of troublesome questions that came up, you know, right when the sort of the public health emergency pandemic was was going, um, you know, really acutely highly up back in, in March. And I think that, um, you know, it's important to remember that we don't believe so far that you know, individuals with diabetes are at higher risk of actually contracting, you know, the virus. Um, but but what we what we do know is that if an individual does contract the virus, um, that they may have potentially um, worse outcomes um, if if they do have the virus and they have diabetes and probably in, in more of an uncontrolled diabetes setting. But just having, just living with diabetes doesn't mean that you are going to get the virus. Um, and I think that's important to to remember, obviously, you know, you want to, to, to be adherent to what of your, uh, you know, public health officials are saying in your respective state to, to maintain social distancing. Um, but at the same time, you're not at a higher risk of getting it. You're definitely at a higher risk of potentially worse outcomes if you happen to get it. Yeah. And is that because of the immune response, Dr. Rao, when your glucose levels are high? Like your, your immune system, is it able to work? Um, better if your values are better controlled, if you're managing well? Yeah, I think the overall, um, you know, sort of general healing process for any type of disease of, of an infectious variety gets affected when sort of you're, uh, you know, you're bathing in a, in a, in a high sugar level. So I, I think probably those who are uncontrolled um, are probably at higher again, probably at higher risk, right? There's so many other things going on with those patients, so it's hard to just pin it down on the uncontrolled mm -hmm. diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then clearly we have some individuals who are in great control. So, you know, we hope that those people will have actually, um, you know, relatively good outcomes when it comes to COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could Please. I ask, is there, oh, I'm so sorry, Joy. No, go ahead. I, I was just wondering. I was just, I was just wondering something, something sparked. Well, something just sparked in me when, when Dr. Mm -hmm. Rao was talking and, you know, you mentioned the immune, immuno response. So with, is there difference then between a person with type one and type two diabetes? And, and then I'm going to also in the mix gestational. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, perhaps the, um, you know, the, the individuals with type two and gestational diabetes could potentially be sort of, uh, thought of in the similar fashion when it comes to the immune immune mediated aspect. I think clearly those with uh, clearly those with type one um, are uh, playing a, a different sort of are in a different setting, right? They are uh, probably making a minimal amounts of insulin. Um, so I think that uh, if if not zero, right? Um, so I think that uh, you know those differences could play a role in the sort of the immune uh, response. Um, but again, I think. There's the aspect of the, the the entity itself, whether it's type one or type two, versus the the relative control, which also plays a role. And I think the when you think of immune responses, I think in, in diabetes, it's been generally thought of as a problem more in the people who are in, a, in an uncontrolled state, being more of a downstream issue with with COVID nineteen. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling, um, you know, like you need modifications to to your care so say you feel like oh there's so many stressors and um and my anxiety is increasing you know do are you seeing um an increased sort of uh desire to access physicians just for small questions um you know is there is there a way for for patients to call in necessary, like not necessarily for an entire visit, but just to ask some questions and say, you know, um, just touch in, like touch base. Yeah, I think, I think this is where, I think this particular aspect that you bring up has been where I think telehealth has been really um, nice for, for all of us. Um, it, it allows that quick check-in and we are seeing this. I've seen this, um, you know, I've seen both ends of the spectrum. I've seen individuals who had uh, you know, amazing control, and then 
so many life events have transpired during this pandemic that um, clearly stressors are playing a role. Um, and you know they see sort of their sugars going up and and the you know the medications they were using before not working as well and then you know they're they're missing that team approach that we provide right it's not just the the provider but it's the diabetes educator or sort of the whole team approach to getting them under better control which they're missing right. you know an aspect of that can be provided you know obviously we're we're doing a lot of telehealth for provider visits and also um, diabetes educators as much as we can. Um, but I do think that those quick uh, touch points have become more common now because people are identifying something that's happened um, and they, and, you know, they're just you know, not understanding what's going on. Yeah. And so I think one of the solutions, you know, comes from um, on the patient and caregiver side as well. You know, I've, I know as a clinician, I've made myself more available to my patients to contact um, through messaging, um, like patient portals, um, things like you, you know, not necessarily a telephone call if they if they don't want to have a telephone call or if they don't have access to um, to a phone. But just in some in some ways, I'm I'm always wanting my patients to reach out. If you if you need us, we are here. You know, we, we haven't shut down. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. I mean, I think these um, these portals provide this sort of engagement back and forth that we we always knew about and had, but I think obviously um, it's been really important um, during this time. Excellent, Serena. What are you What are you thinking there? I can see you're thinking of something, <laughs> and I and I know your peer support is they're <laughs> constantly supportive of each other, and and I see their posts and. Um, and you give shout outs almost every day to just ask other people living with diabetes, how are you? You know, tell me how you're doing. Right. Um, first of all, I'm always thinking. <laughs> <laughs> you are always thinking. I love it. <laughs> always got the wheels turning. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I always try to, um, like on the peer support page, I do give out information about diabetes, but I try to express that sometimes you don't even want to hear about that because you got so many other things going on, sh stress, um, family members, loved ones passing away, um, even other things, even outside of COVID, murders, killings, uh, high crime rates, everything, it's its stressful. So um, I try to, you know, go on there and ask periodically, how, well, how are you? And so how I start that is I'll be like, well, I'll start and put the arrows down and I'll start with something I'm dealing with because sometimes I need to support myself. The supporter needs support sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's important to have the exchange and conversation back and forth just to get it out. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Rao, are you working with, um, with um, sort of community outreach, like in like Serena's case where she's doing peer support or even um, community health workers. Um, I know our clinics do have community health workers and case managers um, and access to resources other than you know what we have in the clinic. Are you are you able to utilize those um, as well? Yeah. Yeah. You know, great great question. I think we've um, you know at Temple we've had. Uh, community health workers for for a long time and and a, and a great uh, sort of population health approach to many chronic diseases. Um, you know, during the during the pandemic, I think um, those individuals have become even more important um, from the standpoint of, of of providing sort of access to care um, and and sort of keeping people on point with what's going on with their chronic medical conditions. So we you know we we've been lucky enough to have some of those resources in in as part of our health system. Um, and uh, I have I have noticed uh, those individuals getting involved. Um, I must say, even at the local primary care clinics who refer to us, I've seen a lot more engagement from uh, even local nursing staff there, um, and and sort of really being you know doing some great in depth care. Um, I think there's I think there's clear evidence that the community health workers can be helpful for a lot of these chronic medical conditions, and 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 if it's safe for them to go out or connect in some way to, with the patients, we're definitely supportive and receptive of any of the information we glean from those interactions. 
for sure. Um, I, I do not think that I can do my job um, well without others. And, and I think we've, you know, in all of our previous broadcasts and just in our everyday lives, we realize the importance of, of community and of multiple entities doing everything that we can to provide that full wraparound care. Um, so here's a question that uh, is a little bit more technical, um, but let's see uh, <laughs> what you can do. I'm so impressed, I'm so happy you're here with us. Um, can some diabetes medic medications um, amplify or increase the mm. response to COVID? Mm. Yeah, I think this has been sort of this hot topic that's come up in the last you know, several months uh, during the, the period of the pandemic. Um, I think it's it's hard to tell uh, a patient uh, now or or a, or, a, or a person living with diabetes that okay you can take this medicine now not only for your diabetes but also because it's going to raise your um, you know immune response. We, I don't think we have enough data to say that. It has been proposed that some of the medications of the class of um, uh, within the DPP4 inhibitor class yeah. um, um, uh, that that there are some uh, models that suggest that those medications might boost the immune system a little bit. Um, and I'm, you know, I'll be obviously happy to share those names of those medicines if people are interested, but I think that, um, that's still an ongoing arena of research and, you know, we'll have to investigate more before we can tell people, you know, this is going to have sort of a double, you know, double effect, you know, not only sugar lowering, but, uh, you know, sort of helpful for the immune system. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of people are, you know, they're looking for answers. Sure, as as, they, as we all should be, right? I mean, we're trying to combat this all together. Yeah, and I think that, you know, being so, such a new um, disease and we're, we're all learning as we go here. So um, I think that that's, that's a really good, you know, synopsis of what could be, but that we need to, we need to know more, you know? Yeah. As usual, there's a lot more. Um, do you have any questions for, for Dr. Rao, ladies? Well, I think just banking on what you just said, Joy, if there's some medications that are helping to amplify the immune response, are there some, Dr. Rao, that you know people may be taking that may actually you know, be a little bit more risky? Um, is that something that you're seeing? Or, or at least supplements, I think, right? I'm sorry? Or even like supplements, right, Marianne? Oh, yeah. And that's a big one that people forget to tell their clinicians that they're taking. That's You're absolutely right, Joy. Yeah. So if there's anything there that maybe you can give us some advice about? Yeah, I, I think within the, um, you know, within the, uh, the actual anti-diabetic medications, you know, whether they're injectable or, or non-injectable, um, I think we, um, we feel safe that uh, most of them are, again, helping uh, the the sugar lowering uh, capability, which is again what why they get approved to be used, right. um, you know, as 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 for immune, um, you know, sort of dropping the immune response, um, not not so clear of that. I would say I think more of the I, I and I I don't know of any therapies that really would be harmful in that way for patients who are taking okay. diabetes who have diabetes. I'm sorry, um, I think that. You know, obviously there are certain agents that you always have to keep an eye on if you're all of a sudden getting dehydrated or getting ill, um, such as, the, you know, this, these classes of medications that we call these, the, the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, you know, you do, you have to keep an eye on your, you know, sort of making sure you're not getting dehydrated quickly from whatever disease that is. I mean, COVID may be one of them, but, you know, many, many other diseases could cause you to become mm -hmm. dehydrated. So you have to keep an eye on that. But I don't think those are, you know, sort of affecting the immune system. Um, the, I think the supplements is a great point and a great question. I think we miss a lot of these, uh, points when we're, um, you know, assessing patients and it's really crucial for everybody to keep on asking, you know, what are you taking that's prescribed? What are you not, not taking, you know, what's right. not prescribed. And I must say in, I've had it, during this period when we initially were doing a lot more of telehealth and I was able to sort of visually see what patients are taking at home for the first time. Yeah. You know, I, I had a deep right. amount of respect that we are clearly missing, you know, a lot of these things that people are taking. Um, and so I think 
to your point, um, it's really hard to say how these things are harmful or helpful when it comes to sort of the immune response, right? We don't, they don't go through any sort of set trials or protocols to understand what they're doing, but they're supposed to be safe or else, you know, you, you know, right. be a problem, but it's hard to say whether you could overdose on things. And, you know, and then we've had such different signals from the media. And so people just go out and do whatever they want. Right. And, and, yeah. and that's been, a, and that's been a hard sort of scenario, but I think, trying to engage as much as with your providers is crucial to figure out is this, you know, you're asking them directly, does, Hey, is, you know, I'm taking this because I think it's going to help my immune response. Is that really true? You know, and I think that will, you know, force the folks to kind of respond in, in, in some way or the other. Yeah. I think, I think to your point of asking um, and seeing, you know, now that we have the ability to sort of see our patients at home, they don't have to bring all of their bottles with them to clinic. Um, we can see them there on their on their you know table as they're speaking to us. Um, so I want to I want to go back to your comment about SGLT2 inhibitors. So this is a class of drug that helps to. Um, can you explain how it works to sure. glucose? Yeah, you know, I, when they first came out, I was thinking, oh my God, this is what we thought of and this is actually works, but it really does. Yeah. Which is, you, you can right. actually you can actually send a lot of uh, glucose, uh, sugar, and also a lot of calories actually out through your urine. So, you know, investigators, you know, sort of figured out that this is a great uh, mechanism to take advantage of in, in individuals with type, type 2 diabetes here in the United States. Um, and so these agents do a great job of, again, shoving a whole bunch of sugar out through the urine, um, which has been sur surprisingly amazing, you know, working. And, and obviously we've heard a lot about the benefits that it has not only on diabetes, but on, on heart disease, which is something I'm very interested in. But I think at the same time, there's, we spend a lot of time uh, with our patients talking to them almost like sort of sick day rules, what to do, um, right. you know, if you're, if you're getting ill for some other reason. So um, along with that glucose or sugar going out, a lot of people can see a lot of water going out. And so, um, you know, what ends up happening is you can, you can, in a state where you're already becoming dehydrated from an illness or an infection, um, you can all of a sudden get dehydrated pretty quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it's, and especially, you know, for example, it's been really, you know, it's been hot in Philly, it's been hot in you know, other parts of this country mm -hmm. this year. Um, so I think it's really important if you are concerned, um, first of all, follow whatever sick day rules may have already been provided to you by your provider. But if not, I think it's important for you to call and ask for them, you know, and so okay. that, that, that they can help you with sort of going through that. Because it's obviously I can't, you know, there's many patients who have heart failure and, you know, uh, high right. blood pressure. And um, if you get dehydrated, those medicines, I think, um, you know, without some knowledgeable person who's given you a way to kind of work around that can, can kind of, you can get even more dehydrated very quickly. Right. Yeah, and so growing on that, I think we should invite Kamla to come and talk to us. She's one of our super fans. Love her. <laughs> she has she has been following our conversation apparently and has just brought up this big question. So with this heat wave, we were talking about the heat in Philly, heat in Houston. Um, what special precautions, especially for individuals, because we have a lot of individuals who are on these SGLT2 inhibitors, but in general, what are some special precautions that need to be taken as a person living with diabetes um, to, you know, to maintain hydration. Yeah, tough, t you know, one of the uh, questions we get asked a lot. I mean, I, I'm, a, I, I kind of, when I talk to patients, I try to keep it quite boring and they sometimes don't like it. I just tell them water, water is the best thing, you know? Um, and, you know, a lot of patients just come to me and say, I cannot drink water, you know, uh, for the life of me. So I try to tell them, you know, sprinkle a little lime or lemon, you know, something to kind of flavor it up a little bit, you know, to make it more, um, you know, satiable, something that you want to actually drink. But I try to remind them that there's a lot of things that can keep you hydrated, you know, things like Gatorade and stuff who have a lot, a lot of, a lot of sugar in them. So you have to keep an eye on that. So I, I try to remind them to, to have a bottle of water at all times, you know, keep that, you know, on your hands. So, you know, put a lot of ice in it as much as you can make it in cold, make it um, easier for you to, you know, take down. Um, and then I think with these, you know, with these medications, I think, uh, uh, obviously, if you're noticing that you feel, um, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, dehydrated or problems with that, then, you, you know, obviously reaching out to your provider uh, to, to find out what to do is, is important. Yeah. Mary Ann, do you have any special tips? I know I, I talk a lot about 
um, about drinking water and how much right. fluid you should have, but also other sources of fluids. You know, um, as a dietitian, I I try to focus on the your fruit and your vegetables and balancing, of course, your fruit for carbohydrate content. Um, using the fruits that are seasonal. Uh, so berries are seasonal right now. They're low GI. Um, right. Using your spinach and broccoli and really any kind of vegetable because vegetables right. have a lot of, um, of yeah. water and, and all of magnesium, all of the mm -hmm. uh, all of the things that you need to maintain your water status. So um, your fluid status. So do you have any special tips that you give patients as well? Yeah, I, I'm along with Dr. Rao in, in, you know, recommending the lemon or the lime. Uh, there's even some products out there that's actually purely just dehydrated uh, lemon and lime and even orange, um, just the essence of them. And you can buy them in little packets. So you can find those in the grocery store. Those are without any sugar or any other artificial sweeteners in them. And all they'll do is exactly what Dr. Rao says is give just a little bit of essence to the water. And then what you said, Joy, about the berries, which have a lower glycemic, um, they won't have a big impact on your blood sugar. You know, you can just take some of those or some of the berries, or you can take some of the cucumber and make what we call, you know, infused water, mm -hmm. um, which gives it just a little bit of a flavoring. And then again, what Dr. Rao said, you know, keeping the ice Sometimes when it's colder, it'll just give you a little bit more um, desire to drink it. But one point that I do want to make, because it just happened to a family member of mine, uh, she went for a walk and it was in the evening when it was much cooler. And, um, you know, of course, she she took all of her um, diabetes supplies, you know, with her. She took some glucose tablets and things like that that we tell people to always carry with them and a charged cell phone. And she had someone walking with her what they forgot was water. Uh -huh. And you know, it was just simple as having a bottle of water. And as they continued to walk, you know, she just started to feel a little bit dehydrated, which was just enough to make her feel pretty bad. And so uh, luckily the person she was with could go and get the car and bring the car back for her. And, and uh, so that was a lesson learned, you know, you can be prepared with everything else, but that water is so crucial. Yeah. Yeah. And Serena and I were talking about this just the other day, right, Serena? So um, we accountability buddied it the other day and um, and FaceTimed one another and uh, right before our workouts. And yeah. one of the things that we talked about was carrying a source of fluid with you whenever you exercise. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I don't know if Philly is as humid as Houston, but the humidity causes you to sweat more. So yeah. that you lose your electrolytes. And if you're trying to, you know, if you didn't hydrate before and you're trying to catch up after, you've missed that crucial time when you're actively sweating to actively replenish um, your fluid stores. And so, you know, the people, I always see people walking with their water bottle and I just want to send out <laughs> a silent, yay, hydration. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget that water. <laughs> Don't forget that water. I just want to, you know, shout out as I'm driving by. I'm so proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> And you know, John, it's important to not only, you know, have it when you're out exercising, walking, but boy, keep some with you in the car and, you know, put it in a little cooler case or whatever, because, you know, I don't know how the Philadelphia traffic is, but here in Houston, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it, you're bound to get stuck in a traffic jam. And uh, if you're not, uh, you know, don't have your water with you and you're stuck in a traffic jam, you know, yeah. what are you going to do? So, yeah. yeah. Keep it with you at all times. And this applies to children too. So yeah. Yeah. I have my kids and sometimes the, you know, the water is just not, not cutting it for them. But, you know, I might put in some um, like frozen Pedialyte pops. You just yeah. put them and use them as the ice right. component and it adds some flavor. Um, and, you know, kids living with diabetes are at risk of dehydration as well. Absolutely. Just finding a way, you know, those popsicles, those Pedialyte popsicles are flavored. They're two ounces of water, um, of fluid about, and, you know, you can give that to them and they kind of think it's fun instead yeah. of like hydration work. So yeah. awesome. I think you, you brought up a great point about, you know, Joy, about not waiting until you're 
thirsty too, you know, because by the time you're thirsty, you're probably already behind. So, you know, if you if you have the bottle, use it, you know, so yeah. don't just carry it around. Yeah, yep. yeah. yeah that's, that's true. Absolutely. And true. I, I even tell people before even getting everything prepared to even go out, uh, check your, your levels um, because oh, you yeah. have everything, but if your levels are too low when you're about to go exercise, you probably need a snack <laughs> before you start. Um, and if your sugar's too high, I think the number is 240. If it's above yes. 240, you should not be exercising. So, you know, you 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 may feel fine, but your body's like, no, I'm not, you know, sit down somewhere too, you know? So yeah, yeah. just check your sugars, please. <laughs> So, so banking off of what you just said, uh, Serena, I think that's a really good point because I think it's something that working in the hospital and especially getting patients ready for discharge, especially patients who have come in so dehydrated that they go into that condition called diabetic ketoacidosis. And if you're watching the show today and you're not quite sure of that, maybe Dr. Rao, you can just give a, a brief um, info on what that is. But uh, what do you, Dr. Rao, tell your patients about checking for ketones? So if you can kind of answer both of those uh, items. Yeah, I mean, I think um, so So diabetic ketoacidosis sort of represents, you know, one of these uh, emergencies that we, we um, you know, unfortunately don't not necessarily, you know, it's still frequent and it happens a, a, a lot more than it probably should be. Um, and I think, it, you know, it, it's, it, um, it's usually connected sort of with um, that you have enough of insulin in your body or, or that you're getting enough of it. And, and I think obviously we think of it more in our individuals with, uh, with type 1 diabetes. And, and, and so what ends up happening is that, you know, because you don't have the proper amount of insulin in your body, you can get a buildup of this acid, which we called keto acid. And, and that can really lead to um, tremendous problems, you know, to the point where, you, you, you know, you will have to most likely go into the hospital to to get um, potentially checked out. Now we try to work a lot with patients to hopefully manage this um, at home and and sort of investigating why they're having the episode happening is it ends up mm -hmm. becoming part of the discussion thread that we have with the patients to find out why did they all of a sudden go into uh, what we call DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, you can you can obviously you'll need a lot of fluids during this period of time, so that's important, mm -hmm. and sometimes that's hard to do sort of over the phone or calling your provider and you end up having to, you need to go in to get an infusion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously with our, if, with our folks who have, um, you know, who have known type one diabetes, we usually sort of tell them, you know, that we usually try to have, make sure that they have ketone ways to measure their ketones um, at all times. Um, and that if they're noticing sort of sugars above sort of that 250 multiple times on thresholds and it's not coming down to make sure to check for that. Because mm -hmm. sometimes if you wait around for a long time, you, you that keto acid is building up and you don't even know about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously we do a lot of detective work to find out w what happened um, and, and why they're, they're in that situation to begin with. Hmm. Okay. So um, before we before we go on to, um, to a good question about hydration, we'll come back to that in just a second. Um, Reva is asking about carrying glucagon. Um, so to, to protect yourself and, you know, um, it's cumbersome. Is there a more convenient alternative? Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, so first of all, you know, I, I, when I talk to my patients, I think of glucagon, you know, probably not being used by the patient, right. But by, by a family caregiver, because the thought is that if you're needing to use glucagon, your sugars are so low that you're either near unconsciousness or, or, or unconscious. Um, um, and I think, if you have a other glucose source uh, to, to bring it up in your conscious, then that's great. You know, that's, that's what should be used. Um, now, having said that, if somebody, you know, feels, you know, and again, diabetes is such a self-management disease. If somebody feels right. that they're in the need for glucagon, luckily we now have a variety of ways to give glucagon uh, more than we did even let's say two years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, we have intranasal versions of glucagon. We have, injections that are a little bit easier to carry around. Um, but I do think that it's, it appears that the intranasal is the best method for this question that you're talking about. But again, I think it's always important to make sure uh, the, the 
patient living with diabetes that asks their provider, when should I really be using the glucagon? Because um, because otherwise, if you have another glucose stored source, that should be preferable if you're you know conscious and with it and able to eat. Mm -hmm. and Can I just ask a question? I'm sorry, Joy. I was no, just going to no. say, maybe for some of our viewer, viewers, could Dr. Rao briefly explain what is glucagon? Because we may have some people watching oh, that right. are not, not right. knowledgeable about what that is. Yeah, good point. I mean, we 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 always obsess about one hormone made by the pancreas, which is which is insulin, right? But there's also the the sort of the you have both the brake and the accelerator. So you have glucagon, right? Which is sort of the the opposite of insulin, helps to preserve and maintain um, sugars that are in the right range and and um, sort of raises uh, sugars up. And so a lot of our patients can not only have a problem with insulin, but they lack the ability to make glucagon, which rescues you from the low sugars uh, if, if and when you have them. And so that's why um, you know, glucagon can be a nice rescue medication in a, in a scenario where a patient, is found, a patient living with diabetes is found down and a family member is not knowing what's going on. Um, it could be as simple as the sugar is so low that they need something to rescue them. And glucagon is a hormone that raises your uh, blood sugars. And so luckily we've been able to, um, you know, several, um, companies have now been able to make that in a variety of ways to give it to patients. Thank you. And so, and so thank you so much. Yeah, that was a very good point, Marianne, for explaining um, what it is for individuals who don't know. Um, and I think that brings, you know, to light the fact that a lot of these things need to, you know, other parts of self-care include support. You know, it, it, it includes your family members or um, or your support or your friends who live with you um, to help you through some of these things, because sometimes you won't be able to manage it yourself. You may not be able to. Okay. So another question that was um, that came through that that references what we were talking about before um, was about hydration again. I think that this heat wave has made people think a lot about it. Um, Hazine says that she stays pretty well hydrated, um, but how can she check? How does she know if she is in fact hydrated enough? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, simple question, right? We should know how to, how to be hydrated. I mean, obviously, you know, I think the simplest thing is to kind of see how your, the, the color of your urine can be helpful, right? To see if you're, um, you know, sort of concentrated and it's looking very yellowish versus it's more a little dilute. And that probably gives you an, an and not looking yellow, some more white, it gives you an idea maybe roughly that you feel like you're, um, so, so if you see yellow urine, maybe you're not hydrated enough, but that's, again, that's just, you know, sort of what you can do at home. Some people may have home blood pressure monitoring capability. They can measure their blood pressure and sort of see if it's a lot different than before, but that's, you know, sort of a next, a next step. I mean, if you feel like you're thirsty, um, you know, your body's pretty great at letting you know mm -hmm. that you're, you're dehydrated. Um, if okay. you feel lightheaded or dizzy already to begin with, if you're having problems when you go from a sitting to, to standing position and you notice some difference, you're probably dehydrated. Mm -hmm. And again, to your point earlier, Joy, Joy, is that, you know, we get dehydrated quite quickly and a lot of times we don't even know it. And, and, and you know, mm -hmm. it's important to, to stay hydrated as much as you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and now for a, we're back to COVID. Um, question. And one of the questions that I think is on everybody's mind, there are some ideas about certain medications that you should take as, um, as like a prevention method for COVID. And so we have. Oh, uh, goodness. Walker. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ready for this question. Yeah. Tough one. <laughs> Can you enlighten us a little bit? Can you maybe explain to people who have not heard of um, hydroxychloroquine um, or or sort of its media pushed sure. um, views about using it for does it worsen diabetes control? Yeah, and I think I think that great question. You know, I think uh, many of us have been tackling this right because. Um, uh, 
various leaders around the world have been touting this as sort of the you know the next thing that's going to you know cure all of the patients with uh, from covid or or prevent them from having it um so you know one point is several of these actual trials right so number one these medications the comments on them should only be under the sort of the jurisdiction of somebody taking it as part of a clinical study and i think those studies have not necessarily showed the benefits that we expected to see uh, from from uh, from what was touted initially, these are all medi- in general. The bulk of these medications being used in um, COVID nineteen have been all around this concept of either inflammation, um, uh, and I think all all of these medications that are being touted are in some ways um, what we call anti-inflammatory. So then you ask, well, what the heck does that have to do with diabetes? Well, the thought has been that. For a long time, people have been, or, or uh, individuals have been th- thinking of diabetes as sort of an in- revved up inflammatory condition. Um, and so these, some of these medications that we're talking about that have been used in COVID have actually already been investigated in diabetes and are being, are, are going through some ongoing investigation. So the answer to the question is, number one, uh, if you don't have a reason to be on hydroxychloroquine, some sort of Im- immunological or rheumatological condition, um, I would not be asking your physician for this as a prescription because you're then taking it away from somebody who actually absolutely needs it uh, is the first thing. Second thing is you, if you're interested, there might be some clinical trials available uh, if you have diabetes or if you have COVID. And I think that's where um, it's important to uh, to keep that in mind um, and, and to take under that sort of jurisdiction of, of, uh, of a scenario. Um, and then um, we will have some, I'm sure we will know more and more about people who received hydrochlor- hydroxychloroquine, for example, and who happen to have diabetes. And once we have those results, I think we'll be able to better be able to tell people that, um, you know, is, is it helpful or harmful? Um, we, at the least, we don't think it should be harmful for their sugars. But again, hydroxychloroquine does a f- slew of other things that can be harmful to our body and should never be taken mm-hmm. just, you know, on the fly. Yeah. Oh, great. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you yes. so much for explaining that, because I think that it is something that, you know, in the, in the same vein of people just grasping for answers, and, and wanting to be safe, we also want to make sure that, um, you know, that we make very good decisions that yeah. don't make less safe, yeah. right? So in, in, the, in the desire to be safe, sometimes we can throw caution to the wind. So thank and it, you. It's, it's, not a simp- it's not a simple medication. It's a complex medication and should not be taken of, as a vitamin. You know, it's, it's, it can cause a lot of problems. So um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Still, stay tuned. We'll have to hear more once about the diabetes <laughs> signal. Yeah. So um, we've talked about people living with diabetes and the people helping them. What about those individuals who, during this time, have you know had their labs drawn and they've been told, "Look, you have prediabetes." What concerns and you know what advice? should we have for them, the p- individuals who are just starting out their journey um, of prevention or management of diabetes um, in this new everything time? Yeah, great, great question. You know, we, we have um, difficulties with this question even outside the time of the pandemic, but even, you know, more difficulties during the time of the public health emergency. I think that, um, you know, the evidence shows, you know, I think that in 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 any way that you can get some great diet and exercise and some help from uh, a group that is focused on prediabetes, I think that's really crucial to get involved with. I I wouldn't um, you know the, the the I wouldn't recommend you know immediately moving towards treatments. You know there are treatments available for prediabetes such as metformin. You know it has been used in prediabetic settings, um, but I think that. There's a lot of, you know, we were talking about the community earlier. There's a lot of community initiatives, uh, whether it be in real person or virtual, that have really spent a lot of time with uh, managing individuals with prediabetes. And this is an important group, right? Because these are patients who have thankfully been detected um, and we don't know where they will where they will go, whether they will develop diabetes or they'll stay the same or they will, you know, sort of regress. So I think that, um, I think, you know, prior to, 
the pandemic uh, here in Philadelphia, we we took a lot of help from the local YMCA's for their diabetes yeah. prevention programs, and that and that was great for a lot of our patients. Um, obviously, being an endocrinologist, I I would love to see a lot more pre-diabetics. I see people who are a lot later on, um, but but many of these patients are seeing their um, primary care providers, um, and I think it's important to have an actionable point, um, and and I think. The YMCA is one example of that community initiative that I think has really worked well. Yeah, and I think one of the things to rem remind our viewers of as well is that um, if you've been diagnosed with prediabetes or if you have a diagnosis of elevated hemoglobin A1C, which is our measure of your blood glucose over the past three months, um, a lot of times you can access those programs um, through your insurance, if you have insurance, Absolutely. or as you said, through online programs on the YMCA, um, for example, the YMCA, but also um, just like some really, um, you know, keep it simple tips, you know, um, if, you, if you haven't gotten into a diabetes educator or yeah. a community health worker or a program, um, tip one, you know, half your meals. So whatever you're eating for breakfast, take a look at it, cut it in half, like just as a very simple before you even see the dietitian um, thing to do. Um, it's not necessarily about taking out foods out of your out of your diet. It's about traffic control. I always explain this to people this way. Um, I think Billy <laughs> Houston can kind of get the get the analogy of traffic. All of us in Houston get on the highway at eight o'clock and five o'clock, like. Millions of people should travel this road eight o'clock and five. But if some people went to work at six, some at eight, some at 10, traffic would flow better. And your bloodstream is sort of that way for glucose. Glucose isn't meant to park on the highway, it must move. So if you eat a smaller breakfast at six, uh, the other half of that breakfast at eight, half right. your lunch at 10, the other half at 12, now you're slowing the transit of glucose into your bloodstream. That will help you. Two, move after you eat, everybody. Just eat and move. We do it yeah. with our children. You know, we, we never let our kids eat and then sit. They've got so much energy. They're hyped up. They're like losing their minds. It's like, <laughs> let's do something. So you fuel the body and then you move that fuel. And then you hydrate. Hydrate so that your body can get rid of any excess. So that is my sort of soapbox for anybody who's been diagnosed with prediabetes before you go in to see your doctor, before just those three simple tips, eat smaller, move after eating, drink water. That's, you know? that's great. That's great. But you brought up a good point too, Joy, for people that you know have insurance. Um, I worked for insurance company uh, doing that type of job years and years ago, but a lot of insurance companies do have um, someone to help them by phone. And that's been going on for many, many years. But I talk to people every day, like I said, in the hospital. And when I, I do bring that up, they said, oh, I never thought about calling my insurance company to number one, see what benefits I have for diabetes education. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, you know, do they have someone who already works for the insurance company who can be like navigating and advocating and helping me? So I think you brought up a great point that, that people need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Super. Yep. So we are running low on time and I want to keep you guys here forever. Um, <laughs> Um, all the time, all the time. But I wondered if um, each of you can just, um, in sort of our tradition, leave behind um, one tip or two <laughs> uh, for any of our viewers who are watching. Um, do you guys have anything like that for us? Stay active. Move around is all I would say. Uh, at this time, it's really hard to just... Yeah sit in front of TVs and devices, but just stay active, move around. Right. Super. Love it. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just say, um, even though, uh, you know, when if you get a, a diagnosis about diabetes, 
Um, it's not the end of the world. You can be successful with diabetes management, but it is hard work. So don't stress too much because you're going to make it worse. Your sugar is going to go straight up through the roof. So try to just, you know, do what you can. Um, find you a good diabetes educator, a dietitian, a nutritionist. If you cannot, you know, you cannot get to those things, there are programs out there, community programs that are for free that you can access. Just relax, okay? Everything is, is, is going to be fine. It's just going to take work. And if you do get sick, uh, or, you know, you could, everybody can get sick with anything. It doesn't have to be COVID, just any type of cold or anything that comes down, but always have that conversation with your healthcare provider, just like Dr. Rao said, talk about those sick day management, sick day plans before you get sick, know what to do. And if you don't have one, reach out to your provider. And um, if you do become you know, ill, make sure you do contact your provider right away. You know, Don't wait, like Dr. Rao was saying, don't let it get to the point where you know, you're really, really sick. Just make sure you reach out. They're there to help you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you all so much. Our, our time here has ended, and I just I wish I could keep you forever, Dr. Rao, but I know that you have to you have to get <laughs> get to see you. <laughs> likewise, likewise. I would I too would love to just hang out with you guys, but uh, yeah, I got to get back to work. So um, thank you, not, thank you. Yeah, just so that you know, you will be asked <laughs> to come back <laughs> at some point. Yeah. Um, we have enjoyed this time with you so immensely. Um, and also to our viewers, thank you again for all of your amazing questions um, and, and great conversation that you stoked today. Uh, remember to mark your calendars. We will be broadcasting every Saturday, 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, and of course, we will bring uh, to you all of our expert panels. We're so very grateful for their time on a Saturday morning. Um, so pull up your chairs and bring your coffee, your tea, your water, hydration. Um, our next episode will air next Saturday, July 25th, when Susan Cosgrove with the Healthcare Improvement Foundation in Philadelphia, she will lead us into an exploration of health literacy um, and how that impacts people with diabetes, as well as the role of providers and health systems in improving communication between themselves. So thank you everyone. And I hope that you truly feel that you are part of the My Diabetes HQ family and community. See you next time. <laughs>